Hey everyone, how you doing today? We have Dion from Dion Talk back. How you doing, buddy? Howdy. Welcome back to One Rental at a Time. I love that. Howdy. I love that. Uh, so, hey, I want to tease out something you're adding to my course, How to Get Started One Rental at a Time, is self-management. Uh, I've been very clear as we're adding more and more sections. I can only talk about what I can talk about, and that's you know buy and hold, landlording, and paying a property manager. I've never self-managed. So you're adding content for that. Thank you. Uh, we're already loading. Uh, we're loading up video one number one today. But I just want to tease it out here for folks that are watching this for free on YouTube. When I think of self-management, there are three parts of it. Uh, and I just want to kind of talk about each, if you don't mind. Is that cool? Works for me. All right. So first one is tenant selection, right? When you hear me talk about tenant selection, I define a box, credit score, income, all of that. I give it to my property manager. They do everything. As a, somebody who runs self-management, you also have to be understanding of tenant law and, and things of that nature. So my first question for you is, do you have a defined tenant criteria or what I would call a box or something similar? I'm going to kind of twist the question sure. okay. on purpose. <laughs> um, one of the really cool things about a course that's structured to learn, because I run a truck driving school and I actually develop curriculum on how, you know, the, the five different ways of learning and how to get mm -hmm. information to stick. When you make a YouTube video, you need a thumbnail that makes people want to click on it. And you need information that's provided, you know, presented in a way that's entertaining enough to keep them there while you give good information. But in a course, a simple concept of how do you screen your tenants when you're self-managing goes back to before you buy the property, yes. you are screening the properties to screen the tenants. Ooh, I like if that. you buy a property that is under an airplane landing strip, next to a train, next to a club, um, or I prefer small multifamily where the units are side by side so you don't have tenants above or below mm -hmm. another. Yeah. I prefer washer dryer in the units because tenants don't like to use a shared laundry or laundromat. So the things that you can do to limit tenant turnover when you're selecting your properties makes self-managing a lot easier. So Ooh. the information, and I am totally honored and thank you for asking me to contribute to the course because there's a way to structure how you self-manage to make it really easy because I work 50 to 60 hours a week running a truck driving school. Then I have a nonprofit that does job placement assistance wow. and I like to have a life. I like to scuba <laughs> dive. I like to do other things. Um, so in all of 2020 with 14 units, it took me just under 27 hours to self-manage all of my properties. Wow. And I've made some videos on, you know, how to self-manage, but it's again here on YouTube, you have to present it in a way where people will want to watch. Um, in a class, you can actually say, these are the steps I took to make it this easy because the goal with self-managing um, for me had two phases. The first phase was I wanted to learn how to do it in case I have a property manager in the future. I know if I'm being taken advantage of or not, just like when I hired a handyman in the beginning, I helped him work on the decks. I helped him put a sink in. Now I know how long it should take to do things. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't do those things, but I know how long it should take them. And the second phase with property management is... Um, coming to understanding the different goals right. as a property owner, tenant turnover costs money Absolutely. as a property management company. Tenant turnover is a part of the fee structure that makes your business successful. So um, I'm enjoying putting the course, the, the videos together for the course, because it's, it's making me structure and think deeper than I have before on how have I made this work for me to where I'm motivated to want to add more units mm. because more units equals a little bit more work, but it equals more cash flow, more appreciation, more principal pay down, more generational wealth for my kids. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, next up, next one, I think of self-management, I think of, you know, kind of daily operations. So um, how do tenants communicate with you, right? Do they have an email? Do they have your phone? Do they text? Do they wave you down when you drive by? How, how does that all work? So tenant communication starts when you're signing the lease or when they're filling out the application. The first ways that you communicate with them, you're setting the pattern. Mm -hmm. um, I make sure that all of my tenants know that some people conceal the fact that they're the owner because they don't feel like they can be the bad person and say no to something. Mm -hmm. So some people will put their properties in an LLC to try to shield their name or just say they're not the owner. I tell my tenants that I'm the owner. I've house hacked twice. So I've actually lived next to some of them. 
but I do tell my tenants that I have partners that I run things by. I've got other investors that I check with. Mm. Um, I'm actually looking at a piece of property that I'm going to send to you and say, hey, am I stupid on this decision? So technically, you're kind of a partner that I'm going to rely on your knowledge for. That way, if a tenant asks for something ridiculous, mm. I can say no. I don't have to tell them it was my cat that said that was a stupid <laughs> idea. That was a partner I ran this by. Um, That's great. So I don't really take phone calls unless it's an actual real emergency. And I let everybody know that. I don't have voicemail set up because it's not 1987 anymore. Okay. Um, text messages are okay for small items, but they're not admissible in court. So I try to limit all communications to email when possible. Okay. And that gives you text and email gives you a good date and timestamp of when the issue was brought up and how long it took me to resolve it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Communicating with tenants I prefer to do it myself rather than through a middleman because a lot sure. of people say, well, I want a property manager so I don't have to deal with tenants. Property manager is still going to call you when it's something yeah. beyond the threshold of what you've set the, for them to handle. Yeah, no question. All right. And then one more thing about operations is, you know, some tenants um, pay late and some don't pay. Uh, so how do you handle the, the whole, do you actually walk up and post a notice? Do you knock on the door on the fifth or the seventh? I don't know what, what the rules are in Washington. But um, you know, how, how do you handle a rent payment not showing up? In the first few years, I handled it poorly. Mm. <laughs> I rented to a friend with a handshake without a lease. Ooh. And I was a single parent. So him being a single parent meant I understood his position. So when rent was late, I didn't even really say anything, which okayed rent being late. Yeah. So then it became later and then it became never. Um, and that's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. Once I got my systems in place and I've had clear communications with tenants that these are the lease. And one of the things that I say is I have tenants from different sources. I have some military tenants. I have some section eight tenants. I have some tenants who are working and some who are retired. And I say as a blanket statement to every tenant that all of my tenants have to be handled the same in case I'm ever audited by section eight or the housing mm. authority or the county. So all For my sure. records show the same. So if a payment is coming in, after the grace period, no matter what, on my leases, there's a $20 per day late fee. Um, since my first two nightmare tenants, um, and there's mm -hmm. wood here, uh, I have never had a later missing payment because I'm crystal clear with the tenants that there is no emotion involved. This is right. a business. This is what is expected. This is what will happen. And even in all of 2020, um, in April, when everybody was really kind of nervous, I contacted my tenants and said, hey, nobody knows what's going on. I'd like to take $200 off of April's rent so that you know everybody can feel more comfortable. Yeah, nice. Half my tenants said no. They said, we're working. Everything's good. Uh, and the other ones took it. And other than that, no. Okay. So I would walk up. I would communicate and say, here's the late fees. It's racking up every day. There have been times where I've texted a tenant on the fifth, which in Washington, how my leases are structured, that's the last day. Just how's it going? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I have to pay the rent. And then I get the rent because I collect rents through Venmo, Apple pay, cash app, any way that leaves an electronic paper trail cool. and send trip to the bank. Nice. Uh, All right. That's awesome. And then the last thing is the, re uh, at renewal. And this is where you're going to add a special video. And, you know, we've called, we've talked about it before called the binder strategy. Uh, but basically, you have a very unique approach where where you spend time up front understanding the landscape around your unit, and you kind of present it to the tenant and go, "What do you think? What do you want?" And then most of the time, they pick, they raise their own rent and sign up for multiple years, right? Yeah. So I'm looking forward to making the binder specific for your course uh, and spelling out literally how you do it step by step because it's a strategy that gets tenants to request so yeah. far 100% of the time, request a rent increase and request a longer lease. Yes. So initially when you're placing a tenant or you purchase an inherited tenant, that's when that's the most effective to make a big jump in rent. I communicate, communic obviously I can't communicate today, but I communicate <laughs> clearly with tenants that I do a 5% rent increase every other year. Mm. And I make sure that everyone I know, whether it's uh, in the Facebook groups like the Real Estate Rookie or the Official Bigger Pockets group or on my YouTube channel or here, that the reason I do this is because we don't have rent control where I live. If we had rent control, I would be forced to do an increase every year. Yes. 
and that usually confuses people. But rent control makes you raise the rent. In other words, your property's you never value back. won't be able to keep up. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Very, very cool. Again, I love the fact that you stepped up to help with self-management. I have no skills there, no experience. So having an expert like you um, be willing to do that is just an awesome feeling. So thank you very much. Where can people find you on YouTube? You have a great channel. Oh, thanks for that. It's Dion Talk Financial Freedom. And hopefully everybody knows every Thursday we're coming together on collaborations or doing videos back and forth. And I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. I think uh, you said that you are happy I'm helping with self-management videos because you don't have that skill set. And believe me, the first five years of investing, I didn't have that skill set. <laughs> um, I've developed it over the last 10 years. Yeah. And folks, if you don't know, I actually paid somebody recently to clean up my description under all my videos. And one of the links below is a whole is a link to Dion Talks uh, playlist on my channel. So you can go watch hours of Dion and I talk at this point. So thank you very much, buddy. Thanks, Mike.